very very dangerous for any society so that is why it's very important that we should try to strengthen our identity and not end up in these problems let's try to understand the gravity of the situation and what i'm going to share to share with you are some statistics from a research conducted by dr umar suleiman so before i show you the answers i like to ask you this question how many children do you think are in that category who do not want to let people know that they are muslims they want to hide their muslim identity how much do you reckon would be the percentage 5% 10% it is 33.3% every third child according to a research tries to hide their muslim identity and it's about those children who are born in in the western countries and they live there who are born here and they have been living here since their birth so one out of three such children try to hide their identity so that's a sign of our identity crisis and also in on top of that there are some children who pretend to others that they are not muslim anymore how much percentage of children do you reckon it would be one in one in every six muslim children is suffering from this problem they want to portray to the people pretend to the people that they are not muslim one in six it's a big number so it shows us the gravity of the situation that we definitely need to do something about that so there might be some people in this room as well in this audience as well who might be going through the same situation so today in this session we'll try to identify some of the reasons why it happens and some of the ways in which we can counter that some of the things that you can do for your own betterment so this research also tells us that as as children grow sometime this this complexity in or in uh, the uh, the inferiority complex sometime it goes away but it goes away only if you go through certain experiences in life if you are fortunate to have an organization like uwa msa and other good organizations that are available locally if you remain in touch with situation uh, organizations like that then that inferiority complex would go away and you would gradually develop a pride in your religion so there are some people who are fortunate enough to have those experiences and exposures in their life and for them that inferiority com inferiority complex goes away but for many people it doesn't happen and i can narrate to you many stories i have got people at my own workplace current as well as previous ones who were born in muslim families but they do not consider themselves muslims sometime when you see a name which appears to be a muslim name and you would expect that they would be uh, sharing the same faith as you but when you meet them you know that they are not so there are many cases like that so and also like once we had a lady come to our house to do some uh, discussion regarding the solar panels and we had um, the shahada on our wall like it's a calligraphy which we have put on our wall she looked at that and said that my grandfather used to have something like that so probably from a muslim ancestry but no more a muslim similarly one of our friends made a documentary on the cameliers and he was meeting their 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 grandchildren and great grandchildren and so on and one of the ladies showed up in bikini like and and in in that thing she has got a, a tasbih as well what we have got the bead string and she said that my grandfather used to recite something on this so this is the situation if we don't work on muslim identity if we don't take it seriously these are the very real things that can happen to us and our families too so it's extremely important that we should understand the 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 reasons why this crisis happens and what can we do about it so in accordance with that i have structured this talk in three sections and these three sections basically explain why do identity crises happen and what can we do what everyday steps can we take to counter those things so the first thing that, that we'll discuss is the external environment that is one of the big reasons why identity crisis happens then we'll also discuss about the community practice there are some practices within our own community that results in the muslim identity crisis and then we'll also discuss some internal factors so these are the three things that we are going to discuss in this talk today so let's first discuss about the external environment these four letters on your screen might look simple to you but for me and my son they 
had a lot of impact and we had some very serious consequences because of that those words spoken to my son so when he was uh, studying in a in a public school in perth some years ago uh, um that was like a covid era and he was having a bandana on his face like everyone used to do those days having mask and covering their face just with different things when he entered his class one of his friends said that you know his uncle's name is osama trying to point out towards osama bin laden and indirectly saying that we are the people who do all these sort of silly things so my son didn't catch that and in fact his uncle's name is osama so he said yes my uncle osama is my uncle and then on that teacher said that the teacher made a report against him and said that he is saying that he's a terrorist so these are sort of things that not only he but many of you would have gone through in your life as well we all get different sort of labels we made a complaint and so on against that school but what i want to highlight is that these things do happen someone going in their car would shout something at you our sisters hear that much more often than our brothers so people say all sort of crazy things so in order to cope up with these situations the first thing that you have to do in order to protect your identity is to understand that islam has nothing to do with these acts with these silly acts which some people do in the name of islam islam has nothing to do with them if we holistically look at the quran and holistically look at the sunna we know that islam strongly denounces all these sort of acts and just one ayah i'll present in front of you and this ayah is when the the bayah happened that the companions would take revenge for the for the for as they thought that usman radhiyallahu ta'ala and had been uh, martyred so they thought that they would go and take the revenge for him at that moment allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the situation usman radhiyallahu ta'ala came back but then these ayahs were revealed and in this allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that why it was right not for them to go in there and 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 attack on the city and remember that's the city of the people who gave them all sorts of torture it's the very city where bilal radhiyallahu ta'ala an was put on the burning soil it was the same city where habab bin al he was put on the burning coals and then the fat from his back used to melt and then extinguish the fire from that coal it was that same city but even about that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says walaula rijalum mu'minuna wa nisa'un mu'minatun lam ta'lamuhum had it not been the believing men and believing women that you you're not aware of that you are not sure of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knew that there are some people in there who would become muslim there are some people in there who would become the upholder of the flag of islam there is a man in there who would be called the saifullah the sword of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so the, the, there is that man still in there so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that had not been those believing men and believing women in there that you do you have not known knowledge about them you don't know them anta ta'uhum that you may trample them under your feet and then what would happen for to see bakum minhum ma'aratum bi ghayri ilmin and then you would get into the guilt because you did that without having knowledge or awareness of that why is that because allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can choose whoever he brings to the fold of islam li yudkhil allah fi rahmatihi man yasha whoever allah wants he brings him into his mercy law tazayyalu la adhabna alladhina kafaru minhum azaban alima and had they been separate like they had been no good people among them allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would have definitely given them a great painful punishment what does it mean this tells us that we cannot do any indecent act against the innocent we cannot do any uh, indecent act against the people who are not fighting against us so all these sort of things islam strongly denounces there's it they have nothing to do with islam and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that had there are good people in there there are good people in there who would accept the faith of islam had that not been the case allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would have given them the the punishment already this is just one of the examples there are many more and 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 all the scholars unanimously say that these acts have nothing to do with islam so this is something that should be clear in our mind so that we do not get into doubt and question when someone presents an ayah or a hadith or or something in a in a distorted manner 
So we should know that these things have nothing to do with Islam and we should have confidence in our identity as Muslim and the teachings of Islam and the Quran and the Sunnah. Second thing I would like to advise everyone is not to have a short term worldview. Sometimes the kids who are born in this age, they just look at their surrounding. They just look at the Muslim countries around them. There's the state of the Muslim countries around them. They just look at the state of some of the Muslims around them and think that this is Islam. This is all Islam has to offer. Sometimes we forget or sometimes maybe we have never heard of the golden age of Islam. That was the age where we used to have the houses of wisdom across the Muslim empire, across the Abbasid Caliphate. And that was the time when books were bought in the price of gold, same weight of gold, whatever the price of that used to be, the books were purchased in that. That was the time when the Muslims ran a major translation movement. The knowledge that was previously confined to small areas, Greeks had their own knowledge, Romans had their own knowledge, Indians had their own knowledge, Arabs had their own knowledge, but that knowledge never cross-pollinated. So Muslims translated everything into Arabic and then began their golden age in which we made all the discoveries. Those of you who are studying chemistry or engineering, much of what you study is coming from your Muslim ancestors. The light that is shining the hall, that is brightening the hall in which you are sitting was invented by the Muslims initially when there used to be light bulbs in Cordoba. The Europe at that time used to be in its dark ages. So many of these inventions are, are from Muslim. The camera through which you are seeing me, so that camera was invented by Ibn al-Haytham. So we have to know about this golden age of ours and have a holistic look at the history. If you just narrow your view of the history, then you would get depressed and you would question your identity. But if you look at all these glorious centuries, you would develop pride in who you are and, and what you have given to the world. You have given the world algebra. You have given the world the equation on which your engineering stand, your modern mathematics stand. Before Muslims, there used to be Roman numbers. No one could do bigger calculations in them. Muslim gave them the, the Indo-Arabic numbers. They gave them the world, the decimal point through which all these things became possible. And they did it because of their religion, because we have to calculate the shares of inheritance in the exact accurate manner and so on and so forth. Navigation, Muslims made great advancements in that. Astronomy, there was no field in which they didn't make that great contribution. So we should understand about our glorious past and have confidence in our identity and have confidence that you and I can make a great, brilliant future as well. So you are the one who would make it, inshallah. Another phrase that many of us would have heard of, go back to where you have come from. So in order to understand the context behind that, we should have grip on the study of Australian history and history of the world. We have to know how this colonization happened in the world. How did those Europeans power went to every part of the globe and colonized the people? How the people in Australia used to be treated as flora and fauna, animals and plants. We have to know about that history, the, the dark times in our history so that we can then uh, have a counter argument to these things. Otherwise, Muslim kids would think that yes, we are foreigners. We should go from where our ancestors came. But who were the original people of this land? The original people of this land were the aboriginals and everyone else came from somewhere. And let me tell you an interesting fact. Before the tectonic plates moved, where did Australia belong to? Australia was just next to India. They both belonged to the same plate. And that is why I am from uh, the Indo-Pak background and I can relate to many of the wor words in Aboriginal language. Many of the words have got commonality with our language over there. So there is certainly a big connection. So we should question that, that we are, we have come here legally. Australia has brought us because of our skills or the skills of our fathers and so on, or because of certain agreements that it has made to the world. So we are here to stay legally, just like everyone else who came here. So it's Australia is very much our country and we very much own it just like everyone else. So there's no place to go back to where we came from. Also, you would see that one of the things that would question your identity is that when people throw things at your prophet, 
at the honor of your prophet. That is why they draw those cartoons and so on and so forth in order to disrespect him. So the way for us to respond and not feel bad about those things is to know about his history. If I ask everyone in the room, how many books have you studied about the Sira of our beloved prophet? And I, I can already guess the answer. Very few people would have read about the history of our beloved Prophet ﷺ, his Sira, in a detailed manner. But there are books out there. We should study them. And we should also study the reasons why those people attack Islam. Before, a, a couple of hundred years ago, it was the age of the missionaries. So wherever the colonial powers went, with them went the missionaries. And one of the tactics of the missionaries was to attack the religion of the opponent. That is why for the 1000 years, as you can see in there, for 1000 years, they had been studying the life of the Prophet ﷺ just to find out the things that they could, uh, they, they could object to. This was their aim. And a lot of scholars have written about it. But the problem is that unfortunately, we continue to see these things in the present time as well. However, people like you in the academia, they answer them in a befitting manner. And I can reference to you some of the books that have been published in the recent time as well, who have got this sort of nonsense views in them. And the scholars of Islam and as well as unbiased non-Muslim scholars have adequately answered them. So this is one book that was recommended by Dr. Yasser Qadi in Muhammad in Europe, A Thousand Years of Myth Making. On top, you can see this book, The Hundred, a ranking of the most influential persons in history. And the most influential person, according to Dr. Michael Hart, is Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Why does he say that? Though he was a Christian, why did he put Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam above Jesus, above everyone else? Why did he do that? The reason for that is that he was the only prophet who proposed an ideology and then establish a complete system based on that ideology in his very lifetime, in his very lifetime. We know about the ban of alcohol in America. It happened in uh, early last century. And what happened as a result? People were drinking when no one was watching them. People came out on streets protesting that we don't want this ban. But this, is, this, this was only Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When he declared that alcohol is prohibited. Whoever had drunk it, they vomited it out. Whoever had stored it in their houses, they just threw it in the, on the streets. Whoever had it in its mouth and hadn't drunk it, he immediately threw that away. So this was the love that the Prophet ﷺ had in our hearts and hearts of the Saab. So we are ready to give everything that we have for his sake. So that is why he was the most influential person whose influence was not limit to, lim limited to a particular time. He is the prophet of all the ages and all the times. And what an irony and what a sad thing it would be that we who claim to be his ummah doesn't study about him, who doesn't study about his approach, who doesn't study about his methodology. Some of those people who object him and, and him says that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, now the billah, may Allah protect us. They say that he failed as a prophet and he succeeded as a statesman. You would hear these things from these sort of so-called academics. What's the reason for that? The reason for that is that they do not understand the methodology of revolution of the Prophet The prophetic methodology comprised of six parts, six, six different stages. The stage in Makkah was a stage in which he was gathering his organization, gathering the believers into a movement. That was the stage of their tarbiya. That was the stage of complete patience so that it is shown to the world who's the oppressor and who's being oppressed. And then came the next phase where a Muslim state was established. And from there came all the expansion. So one of the important books to clarify this aspect is on your screen, The Prophet's Strategy of Revolution. So study that if you want to know why did Prophet ﷺ had different approaches within, in Makkah as compared to Medina. So we owe ourselves to study these things and we owe ourselves to love him to the utmost. So now all these people that have the propaganda, they do the propagandas against Islam, they've got a lot of resources. They've got deep pockets, they've got media and they have got other resources that they use. So what should be our approach? So let's take inspiration from these ayahs from Surah Al Imran that we see on our screen, in which Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Alladina qala lahum 
those people when it was said to him qala lahumun nasu inna nasa qad jama'u lakum that people have gathered against you people are gathering for you gathering to tackle you for show whom so be afraid of them what happened as a result when they were told that everyone is gathering against you it is as if allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is depicting our own story when people are gathering on us when everyone is attacking islam then what should we do fazada hum imana that this thing that people are against them this itself increase their iman rather than being fearful of them it increase their iman and that's what we should do when we face face this islamophobia when people ridicule us when people call us go back to where you came from when people say to us that your uncle's name is usama then this is what should happen fazadahum imana it increased their faith wa qalu and they said hasbunallahu wa ni'mal wakil allah is enough for me and what a good helper he is they have got this confidence in allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that whatever they are doing i'll continue on my mission and he i have got a helper helper like whom is no one so he is on my side i have no worry fanqalabu bi ni'mati min allah wa fadlin and then they came back because the muslims then went out this is after the battle of uhud they again went after the mushrikun so they came back with the nema and the blessings of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wa fadl and 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 his fadl and his grace lam yamsas hum su and the the evil did not even touch him wa tabau ridwan allah wallahu dhu fadlin azim and then they followed what had the path that had the the player of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the acceptance of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they followed that path and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has got a lot of fazl innama dhalikum ash-shaytanu indeed it is the satan what does he do yukhawifu awliya'ahu he makes his friends fear so the fear now that's a severe warning that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving that it is the satan who puts the fear in the hearts of his friends the people who get afraid in these sort of situations and abandon their faith they are actually following the path of the satan so we should not be among those what should we do fala ta khafuhum do not be afraid of him wa khafuni and and be afraid of me rather than being afraid of everyone else what would happen to to, uh, to uh, if if this thing happens if that thing happens rather than being worried about those things you should worry and care only about allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in kuntum mu'minin if you are truly the believers now now look at this ayah wala yahzunka alladhina yusari'una fil kufr and do not be grieved by those people who are advancing in kufr yusari'una means that they are racing they are just um, in in a in a race they are just in a competition that who would do more against the muslims so they are just competing against each other innahum lan yadurullaha shay'a they can't harm allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is being talked about the believers now they, allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that they can't harm allah what does it tell you it means that what you are doing is for the cause of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and their efforts cannot harm you at all because allah is on your side he's saying that this is my company my people so they can't harm allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you are the people of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if you live you would succeed if you die you would succeed so you have got success either way yuridu allah ala alla yaj'al lahum hawwan fil fil akhirah and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not even want to give them a little thing in the akhirah wa lahum adhabun azim and for them is a severe punishment in and now this again is a warning for us innal ladina ashtarawul innal ladina ashtarawul kufra bil iman those people who have traded their iman with kufr because of certain um, things that they want to attain in this life they have traded their iman with kufr what what would their action do lan yazurullah shay'a again they can't impact allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they cannot harm allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if you make an effort you make it for your own sake if you don't you do it for your own self so you cannot harm allah subhanahu wa ta'ala his mission his mission would continue if you and i don't do it allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would pick up would pick up other people and they would continue the mission but the mission would continue wala hum adabun alim and for them is a painful punishment so this tells us a lesson that when we are going through this tough time we should never abandon our faith that muslim identity our faith should be our top priority 
we cannot give it up because of any of the problems that we perceive would happen to us. Another question that some of the people get asked, and you would see various uh, articles in the newspapers and so on, trying to confuse people about their identity. And the question that those Islamophobes ask is, are you Australian first or Muslim first? So as if these two things can never coexist. And this is a very loaded question. And, and this has happened in Britain, where certain newspapers asked this question to various Muslims and then created a controversy and then twisted their statements and made funny articles. The articles which you read, you would certainly know that it has come from a very, very, very biased mind. So these sort of questions they ask and pose us that are you Australian first or Muslim first? How can we preserve our identity? How can we preserve our identity from such questions? So in order to answer that in, in, and in order to clarify ourselves about that, we have to know that what does it mean to be Australian? Muslims came in contact with Australia more than 1000 years ago. There is archeological evidence of that. There were Tanzanian traders and so on who came to, to Australia and there is archeological evidence for that, where, which is very much available in the academia. Also, there were Malay traders that came here. Then the Afghan and Pakistani camellias from Balochistan came here as well. So, the, so what determines that who's Australian and who's not? Is that about the skin color? And if it is that, then it's a very twisted mentality and mindset. So when someone asks you this question, you can ask them that what is the definition of being Australian? If it means that who came here first are the Australians, then obviously the Aboriginal people are the traditional owners of the land. If it means that who migrated here first, then Muslims came here more than 1000 years ago. When did you or your grandfathers came in here? So this is, these are the sort of questions that we should ask and ponder ourselves and reflect as well, upon as well. So we should clarify these things. And as I already mentioned to you that Australia used to be a part of India in the early days and, the, and later on the tectonic plates moved and Australia separated. In, if you want to check this claim, you can also go to the museum, which is now refurbished, the, the museum in the city, WA Museum. And over there, there are various maps about the history of Australia and so on. And you can see where does Australia really fit with. So there's a map in which you move the tectonic plates as you like, and you would see that it perfectly fits with India. It, it was a part of it. Now I'll share with you a couple of statements from some of the Muslim kids between 16 years of age to 20, between 16 to 20. And these are the statements that they gave in that interview. So one of the girls said, and, and, and the reason why I'm sure Doing these things is just to let you know how Saturn tricks us to go into a backward gear. Rather than improving ourselves, rather than moving ahead from where we are, it makes us go backward. For example, look at this statement that came from a from a 16-year-old girl. I feel like I'm never Muslim enough. And their criteria of being Muslim, as we know from that research paper, is how much uh, how much Muslim uh, look they look from their appearance. Like there would be some girls wearing the Baya. There would be some people wearing a nice headscarf with some nice clothing. There would be some girls, girls with um, who would be having a hijab, but with a lot of makeup on and so on. And then there would be girls without makeup and so on. So that was the criteria that some of the youth have set for themselves with regards to how Islamic they look. So this girl says, I feel like I'm never Muslim enough. So why even bother trying fitting in with the masjid? But at the same time, when I have to pray around my non-Muslim friends, I find myself not wanting to because I don't want to remind them that I'm different. So what does it tell us? It tells us a couple of very important things. One thing, it is the Saturn which is trying to put her in a backward gear. Rather than where she is, she, doesn't, she feels that she doesn't look Islam, Muslim enough. She should improve from that. Rather than that, Saturn says that go back, backward. If you don't do this good thing, maybe just leave the other good thing as well. And there's a principle in Islam as well, which says that if you cannot acquire everything completely, you do not leave it at all, 100%. You cannot leave it in full. So you get whatever you can get out of it. That's the mentality that Muslims should have. Whatever goodness you can gain, gain. Do not go backward. So here Saturn is telling that go backward. You don't do this good thing, there's no problem. You leave the other as well. And then that would create a divide which would be very difficult to fill. If that connection with the Muslim community is broken, 
then the same thing can happen as I explained about that girl who one of my friends um, recorded an interview for during a documentary. So the same thing can happen to our kids as well if we break away from the community. So it's very important to clarify ourselves that we can only improve. We cannot deteriorate. We cannot go backward. So we can only go into the forward direction. Another thing uh, that came from a 20 year old boy and, and that boy said in his interview, I told all my non-Muslim friends that I left Islam and they celebrated me for that. I went to prom and made up this story about how my parents threatened me for it. And that really impressed my date. So sometimes because of those little worldly gains, you have to remember that this is the age in which certain hormones are at their peak, but we should have the right vent for them. For the parents, they should get their children married early. If, if it's when they achieve the legal age and when they have got a right match available, people should marry. If they don't, then they, they vent out their energies and their desires in these wrong ways. So just in order to impress a date, that guy pretended as if he has left Islam and made up a story that his parents are threatening him for that. So these are all the tricks of Saturn that we should be aware of. And we should train our kids from the very beginning about those things. Another important question that we all need to understand in order to protect our identity. Is there a difference between multiculturalism and assimilation. We all hear a lot about multiculturalism, that Australia is a multicultural country. No one hears that there's a department of assimilation. No one uh, hears that we should be assimilated except from some Islamophobic politicians. And there are a few who say that, that Muslims don't look the same, they don't drink what they drink and so on and so forth. So there are some, uh, some, some people who have got this level of evil mindedness. But I'm talking about in general, the, as a policy, Australia is a multicultural country. It means that you can continue to practice your culture. You can continue to practice your religion without being asked, uh, without being hindered in its implementation. So that's the multiculturalism. So multicultures exist in the same land. It is different from assimilation. Assimilation means everyone looks the same, dresses the same, wears the same, appears to be the same, and there's nothing to differentiate between them. So assimilation is not an Australian policy, multiculturalism is. So we should have confidence that if we look different, it's perfectly fine. We should not be, we should not be thinking like that sister of ours who thought that if she prays in front of Muslim, uh, non-Muslim friends, they would think she's different. So we should not have any problem with that. It's okay to be different. It's okay to wear hijab. It's okay to not eat pork. Sometimes at workplaces, it does become difficult, but as Muslims, you should have confidence that for me, my values come first. If you really believe that this religion is truth, then how can you go against it? So either we do not have firm faith or we are denying ourselves of the truth. Also, you would see that when you, your kids go to sports competition and so on, and they would celebrate. When they grow up, they would celebrate by opening the champagne. And as we see sometimes, that some of the Muslim players stay away when these sort of things are happening. But how can how much your kids can resist that? It's just about the celebration. Later on would come the time when they would all be going to uh, maybe a dance club and your kid would be a young man as well or a young woman as well. And they would have desires in them too. How much they can protect themselves. So in order to ensure that they protect themselves and preserve their identity, it is very important that we should work as community and as parents on four important aspects. One of the important aspects is the intellectual aspect, that why I'm doing what I'm doing and why I am not doing what I'm not doing. So we should be very clear about that. Then the social, so this is, this basically leads to Iman ala vajhil basira, that I believe I'm a Muslim because of my understanding, because of, I understand this to be a true religion. I'm not, not just following some practices of my forefathers. And that is why, you know that many people who come from the countries where the Islam is implemented as a deen, when they come here, even then they leave Islam. Why is that? Because they don't have the intellectual foundations. So if we are in that phase too, where we follow just follow something that Islam says, but we do not understand the intellectual basis of that, we should go a step 
an extra step and try to understand the intellectual basis. Because the Prophet ﷺ said that he and his companions, their belief is Allah Vajhil Basira. That it is because of the Basira, it is because of the understanding, it is because as if they can see it. So we can also acquire that by establishing intellectual foundations for our faith. Then there should also be the social factors. If someone is alone, if a fish is moving against uh, in the opposite direction to where all the other fish are going, it can resist only for a short period of time. But it's much easier for the birds to fly in their flock. It's much easier for the sheep to move in its herd. So it's much easier to move in one direction where there are a lot of people moving with you. You do not feel yourself lonely, that I'm something different, I'm alone in this walk. So if, you are, if there are people who are moving in the same direction, if you are sitting this, in this hall and there are other people who are sitting with you with the same intention, the things would become much easier for you. But if you are all by yourself, if you don't have that social backing, then definitely there would be, there, there can come a time when you would question your identity and just try to be like other people. Because the, the religion of the man, the way of the man, the lifestyle of the man is upon the lifestyle of his friends. If that is all the social circle that you see, you would become one of them too. So that's why it's very important to have that social backing. Also, the third thing is the emotional attachment with the religion. We should feel emotion. We should have emotions when we hear about Islam. We should have emotions when we hear about about our beloved Prophet We should develop a habit of having tear in our eyes when we hear his blessed name. So then we would have a connection with Islam that would go a long way. The last but not the least, the spiritual connection. We should have a direct connection and friendship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you have that friendship, if you have that connection, if you are able to talk with him in seclusion, that would give you the biggest boost to your spirituality that would give you the biggest boost to your Muslim identity. So have friendship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that those who believe, they are shadeed in their love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are extreme in their love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So have that connection. And that would give you a very long lasting Muslim identity. Another thing that some of the people face is that they have, for especially Especially for those who have migrated to this land, they think that it's not right to raise their voice for justice. If we say something, people would feel bad and so on. That is not the right mentality. Slave, slavery got abolished in this world because people spoke against that. They spoke against the practices of that time. So whatever is just and whatever is right, we have to speak it, speak for it. Be it the Black Lives Matter movement, be it, be it the original lives uh, matter movement, or be it the Muslim Lives Matter movement in Palestine, in Kashmir, and everywhere in the world. We have to raise our voice for what is right and against what is wrong. So it's our responsibility. And by doing that, we are doing a favor to ourselves, to the humanity, as well as to the country by making it a more just place to live. So with this, we have finished with our um, section on external environment the factors in the external environment that can make us question our identity. We now move on towards certain community practices and the remaining two sections would be much smaller than the first section that we have covered. So if you're worried about uh, the session getting over time, so you can relax. We'll probably finish in, in time or maybe just five minutes over, inshallah. So let's start with the external environment. So one of the reasons uh, or one of the factors that have come out in research why some people question their Muslim identity is because of treatment by Muslims, treatment by certain Muslims. So for example, some of the women said that they do not feel very welcome in the, in the mosque. And just like other things, this is again something which is more to do with culture than our religion. And we have all the right to question that. This book on your screen is one of the books that I would recommend um, everyone to read. It is by Dr. Jasir Oda. And in this, he says that how women were always a part of the Masajid, how women used to be the teacher of the male Muhaddithin. So that was always our culture. They used to, uh, they used to have a place in the Masjid. Even in the lifetime of the Prophet Sallallahu the, the mothers of the believers could easily walk into the mosque and, and sit with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Even at night, even, even during the Aitikaf, they could come in there freely. The Ummahatul Mumineen also used to offer prayer, the night prayer in the Masjid. 
companions asked the Prophet ﷺ, the female companions, that when we come, it's too dark in the morning and sometime our feet get into uh, some impurity. Should we still come? The Prophet ﷺ said that, yes, still come, because what comes afterward cleans it, like sand. When you keep moving, it cleans your clothing. One of the female companions asked that if someone does not have her own jilbab, the outer garment, should she, should she still come for the prayer? The Prophet ﷺ said, yes, they should still come. Maybe two friends can borrow the same jilbab, same external garment. So these are the guidances of our religion, and we should completely segregate it from our culture. Women should have a place in the mosque, and we should be very vocal about it. So this book can clarify some of the misconceptions in that regard. And also then uh, during the research, it was identified that there are certain attitudes of the Muslim that, that um, put certain Muslim youth away from the religion. One of the things was inability for the, of the Imams to understand the issues of the youth. We are very fortunate in Perth that, alhamdulillah, we have got Imams who are very understanding. We have got people who are grown up here and now they have become the Imams. So they've got those very strong foundations. But that's, that's not so much the case in some of the other cities. And there have been research papers uh, in the academia written by the Muslim researchers who have identified that in some of the Australian cities, there is no locally trained Imam available. So when I was doing my research, I focused on this topic as well, that the local nurturing of imams. And, and there are many, many beautiful details about um, that research that maybe I can share some other time. But the fact of the matter is that there are, there, are, there are very few opportunities for the local training of imams. So accordingly, we have to import the imams from other countries. And sometimes they're unable to connect with the youth and understand their issues. The second thing is that if we look at the talks that are generally given in the khutbahs and so on, sometimes they do not relate to youth. So what we can do as community, especially as Muslim organizations, as UWA, as MSA, as ICANN, as other organizations, what we should do is to give meaningful talks and meaningful khutbahs for our youth that they can connect with. Also, they should be given freedom to question things. Many of the kids who have been born here and who have been raised here, they do not have those sort of um, background and, and context that some of us who were born in Muslim countries used to have. We used to have our great grandparents and grandparents with us who used to tell us a lot of things. They used to teach us every day. But some of our kids, they do not have the same privilege anymore. So they should be allowed to ask questions. And the questions should be listened to with an open heart and answered accordingly. Tonality of the Imams was also raised as a question by some of the youth. And they said that sometimes they always appear to be angry. So this is again something that I and, and uh, our other brothers and sisters have to work on. Now, a very important aspect about parenting. And that's the thing to me, which creates a huge dent in our Muslim identity, a huge dent in our Muslim identity. Many of our parents that I come across in the community are too busy. They are just too busy with their life. They have got time to play cricket. They have time to go to go, go for their entertainment and so on, but they have not, they do not have time to nurture the Muslim identity in their children. Now imagine being a child who comes to Australia he goes to a public school where there's no opportunity for a Juma prayer, no opportunity for other prayers. You come back, your father and mother are just busy with their things. You don't even offer the Juma prayer. What sort of a Muslim identity would you develop? So that is why it's very important to have those sort of initiatives in our community, which gives, gives this identity to our kids. We should have those events where they can have Muslim friends where they can see what does Islam stand for, where they can learn about Islam in a friendly manner. So we don't, we are not giving these opportunities to our kid, unfortunately, a vast majority of us. And they are in this false confidence that if they are Muslim, their children would remain Muslim too. And that is not unfortunately how it works. Many locally born children, approximately 25%, according to our research, are leaving Islam. That's an on-ground fact that we have to deal with. So we should provide our kids with an opportunity to connect with Islam, to have Muslim friends, to, to, to have a free environment where they can question anything. It's, we owe this to our kids and we owe this to ourselves and we owe this to our next generation. Also, for many of us, we ourselves don't have correct understanding of the deen, then how can we teach that to our kids? We have got messed up priorities in our life. For us, job comes first. 
for us money comes first and that is the same thing that our kids are picking from us for them religion comes second third or maybe it may be at the bottom of their priorities because that's what they see their parents do just job is important for them cricket is important for them their entertainment is important for them no concern for the religion and also many of our parents have got an inability to separate religion from the culture so you guys would be parents of tomorrow you guys would be become parents for tomorrow so i would request everyone to keep these things in mind and play your role and do whatever best you can do to to make your future generation come out of this identity crisis we now move on to our third aspect which is internal factors so by internal factors i mean the internal processes internal thoughts within us that make us think certain in certain ways so first of all i would like to explain this aya some of us have got a twisted relationship with allah subhanahu wa taala we believe sometimes we think that whatever we utter from our tongue allah subhanahu wa taala is obliged to fulfill that and if he doesn't then we don't believe in him and i have come across such people in perth Who who say that Allah Subhanahu? I made that dua to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. I made it for a long time. Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala did not listen to that, so I don't I don't believe in God anymore. Was that an order that you placed in a restaurant? Was that an order that you placed at Kmart that if it didn't come, you won't uh, ever trade with that uh, shop again? Our relationship with Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala is not like that. Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala explains us. Wa ida amna. Alal insani. Whenever we do a blessing or favor upon the man, aaraza wa na abi jani bi, and then he just turns his face and say, doesn't give much attention to that. Doesn't doesn't bother when we are giving the blessings. He is not much uh, thankful for that. Wa ida masa hu sharra sharru, and when even the evil just touches him, not he is fully uh, uh, fully indulged in that. Maybe just even if it touches him. kana ya usa he becomes the most disappointed person so this is our state that when allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is blessing us when we are sinning even then he is filling our lungs with air we are not thankful for that but when even a little bit of a problem comes in our life we are happy to give up our faith for that we are happy to stop believing in allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for that so is that thing more important that we as compared to our relation with allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that little thing that we are asking for more important in our life than our life in the hereafter so these are the sort of questions that we should clarify ourselves about similarly some people sometimes sometimes people give up their identity and do silly things because of the wealth they would sell the things that are prohibited just because of wealth they would invest in the interest based systems because of some mere money some mere dollars and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam warned us around uh, about that and he said ala inna dinara wa dirham ahlaka indeed that the dirham and dinar uh, uh, did the halaka for them then they it, they were destroyed because of that man qana qablakum those people before you they were destroyed because of that wa huma and these two dirham and dinar muhlikakum and they would destroy you too so we should be mindful of that and not do things um, that are against our faith just for 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 this money and so on now very quickly i'll share with you a glimpse of the western thought when we do the critique of the west it does not mean that we are critiquing the people living in the west it's the thought process and the thought process has got a rich history as i mentioned to you when we were enjoying our golden age in the europe it used to be the dark ages and then from the islamic lands from islamic spain that knowledge entered into europe and then because of that in europe two movements started one of the movements was renaissance in which they uh, made various scientific discoveries and the other one was reformation in which they re they refined their own faith they renewed their own faith and came up with a different interpretation of the religion what happened as a result they separated out religion from the affairs of the state and then came the the age of materialism when god went out they were so angry with the religion they because at that time what the, some of the christian churches were doing were inhuman they were giving people forgiveness for their seven generations for a piece of land for for some from for some money they were just giving away forgiveness the person who doesn't have money what he can give you give to the church 
they couldn't be they couldn't get forgiven so that was the state so people developed a lot of hate for the religion and then they threw out religion and that started the age of atheism with that another thing came as gift when you know that there is no god when you have entered atheism then everything for you is universe all you are worried about is universe and that is why we see all this exploration and so on when you believe that we are just animals who have evolved then there is no concept of ruh there is no concept of soul all you have to worry about is the physical body how do i look uh, how many kgs of weight do i have how much uh, like how is my skin color and so on we are just worried about these things how comfortable my body gets when it sits on that expensive sofa and so on this is all we are worried about so this is the thought process that unfortunately many of us have adopted as well though it's in complete contradiction to our religion so why i am sharing that i'm sharing that for you to understand the difference between this thought process and what our religion says and if we understand the basis of that if we develop confidence in that if we research that and understand how how much beneficial for the humanity is what our religion teaches us we'll have more conviction and more confidence about that so this is what i advise you that we should have deeper connection with the quran and we should study our religion in a focused and organized manner and when this identity would get clear to you when it would become clear to you you would not compromise on your values you would be able to sacrifice for your religion and this conviction in your identity would completely transform your life then you would become a person like abdur rahman as-sumayth who who on whose hands 11 million people accepted islam thousands of masajid thousands of wells were built this only happens when you have got pride in your identity when you know why you are doing it what you are doing so then you would become you and i would become people like him then you and i would become people like sheikh ahmad didat who studied islam for 40 years not 4 years not 5 years for 40 years and then debated everyone the upholders of the the evil ideologies he challenged all of them openly then you become dr zakir naik who gave 17 hours of his day every day to the cause of islam that only happens when we are clear about our identity then you become person like hakim mohammed said who gave 100000 uh, uh, 10 million prescriptions in his life 80000 pages of intellectual writing and a number of other achievements only happens when you have got pride in your identity if you don't have pride you would never take that endeavor you would never tread on that road and with this i come to the last point of this presentation you guys did a personality quiz in which you identified certain spiritual personalities so some of you might have the the personality type of hand of power these are the power the people who are the go getters who go and do things so this uwa msa has got several opportunities for you to do that they organize a number of events they they need people like you who can provide the on ground support you who can check the sound system who can organize the flyers who can talk to the shio who can make other arrangements on ground things you need to do so you are, you can help them in that regard you can be the organizer for the next uwa event offer yourself for that some of you are the voice of justice who can raise your voice against what's what wrong is happening against people you can raise your voice for the people the oppressed people of kashmir you can raise your voice for the oppressed people of palestine you can raise your voice for the oppressed people of yemen you can raise your voice for the oppressed people of east turkestan the 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 eager people of of the china so you can raise your voice for all these oppressed people you can raise your voice for the black lives matter you can raise your voice for for how slaves were treated in the west when and when in the muslim lands the slaves were given palaces if you study about the life of sultan salahuddin ayyubi you would know these slaves were given the best of the places to live and they were given the best of the education and they were given the best of the positions in the army and so on and some of the later governments were formed by these very slaves who were treated like princes by sultan salahuddin ayyubi so you can raise your voice against injustice that happened against the slaves in america it what happened to slaves in other part of the world you if you have got a heart of inspiration you can provide ideas you can provide thoughts you can provide inspirational ideas and opinions and suggestions that can guide the community to a new 
numerous projects that we very much need. If you've got eye of vigilance, you can help us with continuous improvement. You can identify what can be improved in the musalla. You can identify what we can do to improve events like what we have done today. So you can share your feedback, share your critical opinion, and that would help UWA community improve and, and continuously improve. And also it would help furthering the cause of Islam across the world. And you and I then would be contributing to the mission for which we were sent in this world. We would be strengthening our identity and putting it to use. And with this, inshallah, I'll conclude. Uh, if you've got any questions, please feel free to ask. Can you hear us? Yes, I can. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, we'll give you opportunity for some questions now. Does anyone have any questions? Okay, um, then thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We really appreciate you doing this despite not being in Perth right now. Um, we have a small token of our appreciation, which I will find a way to get to you, inshallah. Thank you very much um, for your time. Don't have any questions. He's up here. He's gone. Okay. Yeah. <laughs>